question. I have apologies from Sarah Rawling. Uh, and I see that everybody else is here, so I, I guess there's no need to, to do a roll call. Um, is there any declarations of interest? Oh, fine. OK, then. Well, for item three, um, is there anybody, any nominations for the position of chair? Yes, if I could I, come in. Sorry. Sorry. No, on you go, Alistair. If I could nominate my colleague, Derek Loudon. Derek's had great experience over the council over these past five years and would be ideal to be chairman of the area committee. OK, thank you. And is there a seconder for that? I can second. Oh, I can second that. Too much of all that. OK, then. Thank you. And, and I have a nomination, I Fiona. Yeah. I'd like to nominate um, Councillor Molly Nolan. Yeah. Thank you. And is there a seconder for that? Um, thank I'm you. happy. Pauline, thank Pauline, you, Pauline. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, we've got two, two nominations. I have um, Derek Loudon is nominated by Alistair Rind and seconded by Tamala Colley. And I have a nomination for... Uh, Molly Nolan by Maxine Smith and seconded by Pauline Monroe. So I'll just do a quick vote. Um, just if you just let me know who, who you'd like to vote for. Um, Councillor Collier. Uh, I would vote for uh, Derek, uh, Councillor Loudon, please. Um, Councillor Loudon. Okay. Um... Okay. I'm going to vote for myself. Okay, Councillor Derek Loudy. Um, Councillor Munro. Oh gosh, I, I like the vote. I don't. I don't really mind. That sounds awful. But yeah, Derek is chair and Molly is vice. Maybe Derek is chair. Sorry. Derek is chair. Okay. Um, Councillor Nolan. <laughs> um, thank you, Councillor Smith. Um, I'll put a nominal vote in for myself. That's very kind of you. Uh, Councillor Rind. Derek Loudon, thank you. And Councillor Smith. I'm Councillor Nolan. OK, well, there are four votes for Councillor Loudon and two votes for Councillor Nolan. So, um, Councillor Loudon, you, uh, congratulations, your chair, and I will hand over to you for the next item. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much um, uh, for the uh, for the votes. Um, and I'll uh, I'll not make a speech at this point because we have other uh, uh, another role to fill. So um, we better um, uh, get on and do that. So I'm looking for nominations uh, for the role of uh, vice chair. OK, Derek, I'd like to nominate Molly again, please. OK. Um, do I'll we second have... that, Derek. I'll second that. OK, um, do we have any uh, other nominations uh, for the role of vice chair? Can I nominate uh, Councillor Rind, please? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tamala, for that. Um, and can I second that? that that's fine. I'd like to do another quick vote. Um, so for vice chair, we have uh, two nominations. We have uh, Councillor Nolan is nominated by Councillor Smith and seconded by Councillor Monroe. And Councillor Rind is uh, nominated by Councillor Collier and seconded by Councillor Loudon. So I'll just, uh, if you just tell me who you'd like to vote for, Councillor Nolan or Councillor Rind. Um, Councillor Collier. Sorry, it's going to be Councillor Rind, sorry. Uh, Councillor Loudon. Uh, Councillor Rind, please. Councillor Monroe. Uh, Councillor Nolan, please, to represent our area. Uh, Councillor Nolan. I'll put a vote in for myself, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rind. Hey, hey for Councillor Rind, thank you. And Councillor Smith. Councillor Nolan. OK, so we have three votes for Councillor Nolan and three votes for Councillor Rind. Uh, so we unfortunately have to turn to um, cutting of cards. 
uh, there's no casting vote for when it comes to appointments. So uh, I came prepared. I'd like if to I, do a fancy if, shuffle, but, but if I, I could, don't. I, if I, I'm not, not keen on our cards, but uh, I'll pull out and uh, accept Molly as vice chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Thanks, Alistair. Okay, no, no problem. Thank that's you, good. Councillor Ryan. Thank you. Okay. OK, um, so if I'm right, we've appointed a chair and we've appointed a vice chair. Um, so that's us moving down the agenda. Uh, item five is an area performance summary report from a uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And we're joined this morning by uh, Ricky Double. Um, who uh, will be uh, will be here to uh, to lead us through the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, report. So, uh, Ricky, if I can uh, pass over to you. That's fine, Chair. Thank you very much, and congratulations to you both on your your new positions. Yeah, wish you all the best Thanks. for that. Uh, the report was sent out to you, so am I right in assuming you've all had a wee chance to look at it? Because I, I don't think there's any any worth unless you want me to to go through it page by page and line by line probably just to open up and ask if you've got any questions about to me regarding the report okay um does uh, do any of the members have questions on uh, the report which was uh, circulated in uh, with the papers uh, for the meeting Yeah, Councillor Nolan. Thank you. Um, I just wondered, uh, I refer to page nine about deliberate fires, and I just wondered, um, there's clearly quite a worrying trend going on, and I know um, other councillors will have noted that as well. I know there's particular issues um, in Invergordon at the tank farm, and that's a worry for, for local residents around there about the safety of the site. And I was wondering if there's any enforcement action that can be taken either by the fire service or by the council to, to make that site um, either safer or make it make it more secure to reduce those incidents. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. The, the tank farms always on our radar and has been a concern, and I'm, the council are fully aware of it. We do get a number of incidents there. We did have a little bit of a spike of incidents here in June, but that was down to one individual who was kind of rampaging about getting fired at things. Uh, he was caught and he did own up to it and it was suspected that he'd probably set a few of the other fires that showed up in the report. So he's been caught and he's been spoken to the police and action's been taken, taken place with him. Uh, and the crews have also been into the, the schools up there uh, and done some work with the, with the kids raising awareness. So we did react to what we saw when we seen this spike and we are working about it and I say we are aware of the tank farm and we do work with the, the owners to try and mitigate any accidents happening up there. Hopefully that will answer your question, Councillor. Uh, you. Councillor Monroe. I think you're muted, Councillor, sorry. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> anyway, thank, thank you for the report, it was very good. I'll tell you what, uh, my not a big, it's not really a big issue, but it's something that maybe you could maybe do a wee bit of work in all this about the local woods. I'm sure you'll know all about. There's been quite a few fires set up at the Burnside Woods. Yeah. And of course, I get sent lovely pictures and things. That's lovely. And uh, also the Crawl Park in Allness is another place. So I don't know if it may be a good idea to go back into the academies and have another word because I do know it's academy children because I've been given, well, obviously, information that I can't put out here. But yeah. Just a, if you could maybe have a wee look at that for me, Rick, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah, we certainly will revisit it, but we have had a bit of school engagement now in this within the, in, the, in the past few months, so it's maybe yeah. someone I will I'll ask them to revisit. Also, can I just say before we go, can you please thank Invergordon Fire Station for me, please, because they came out and helped with the Stoltman Day, so I'm sure all our local members here will be Delighted to say thank you to them because they did a wonderful job. They came out on a Friday night. They were out with us all night on Friday night, putting up all the bunting. 
And then they came with us all day and they had the kids in the fire brigade and everything. So I just like to really thank them. They did a fantastic job and we we're very proud of them. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on the back of um, what Councillor Nolan was asking about the tank farm. Um, just, just kind of just for information, obviously we know it is privately owned. Um, they do try and make it secure every so many years, but within days of it being secured and the fence is being fixed, it gets broken into again. And not by anybody, you know, doing vandalism or anything. It's just by dog walkers and it's used as a shortcut. So over the last few decades, we've tried everything, but um, nothing actually works to make it secure. So we just kind of have to live with it. But I'm really um, encouraged, um, Ricky, to hear that you did find um, the person that set that fire and set a few fires because it was becoming a worrying trend in Invergordon, um, like almost a weekly basis. So well done in that. Thank you. Is there anybody, any more for any more, as I say? OK, uh, Ricky, I think um, the only, um, uh, there's a, Maybe uh, maybe a question on uh, page uh, 13, um, just in terms of availability. I think the, the second appliance in Invergordon uh, looks like it's got availability of uh, 48%. 48%, yeah. Yeah, is that, is that a sort of normal situation or? No, ideally we would like both appliances available 100% and that's what we aim for uh, across the service, but we have We've got major recruitment challenges just now, which we're going to touch on, but since you brought it up, I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. And we're going to be a wee bit unfortunate in that we've had, uh, we've had, a, had a resignation there and for two transfers out of the station. So the numbers mm -hmm. have, have dropped a little bit, but we have got two new recruits in the next training course, and we have three in the system. So although we've lost a couple, we've got five coming in. So we're we're constantly pushing to, to maintain full crews. Okay. If we get full crews, then the availability of the second appliance will go up. Having 99% of the first appliance is fantastic. It's really good. Yeah. Seven, and we've always got crews round about to back them up. But ideally, we'd like to push up the percentages uh, for the second appliance as well. I would ask you, if you're, when you're out and about, if you can encourage people to step forward, show an interest, go speak to local stations, because I say recruitment is a massive challenge across the Highlands at the moment. Mm -hmm. We're trying all sorts of different avenues and things to attract people, because the attracting them is fine, but then it kind of holds on to them, because people's lives change, and it is a big commitment, and it's not for everybody, and we're really grateful to all our all our staff that step up and do it, but we, we need to keep pushing and uh, taking people in. In terms of, uh, well, we're talking about staffing, we're having a bit of a restructure within Highland in that we've managed to secure a, an additional station commander who was based in Hullapool. So it means that, uh, it's, it's great for us because it, it gives us an extra station commander a bit more cover. So he started up there last week. So it means we've had a slight shuffle about of who's responsible for what stations. Uh, you've still got Miles up with you just now. Uh, it's meant a little bit of change for some of some of the rest of us. We're also going through a, a large time of recruitment, or not recruitment, but promotion, because the, the pension remedy for fire service changed. We've had a number of staff who are leaving, uh, a bit similar to the situation the police are in just now. So we're having to run a lot of promotion processes. So you may see a change in some of the management teams in the north. Uh, as soon as that starts to happen, we will we will be in touch, and hopefully we we can continue to provide the service we do. But there, there's going to be a turnover of staff over the next few months, just because okay. of pension schemes and things that are going. But you've got all the contact details. So if you're not sure of who it is or yeah. who you need to speak to, just shout to somebody you know, and we'll, we'll always get back to you and support you as best we can. Okay, yeah. um, that it's maybe. Uh... Recruitment's maybe something we could help you with, and you know, if you had sort of a PDF or something like that, or a, a, a direction to uh, somewhere online, um, I'm sure uh, members would be uh, more than happy to uh, to share it. 
um, to their own contacts and uh, try and help you out with that. That would be great. Uh, thank you very much. I will speak to Miles and I'll get him to send you some information. Yeah, that would be great. On my job site. Yeah. Um, one other thing. Uh, it's just a uh, really um, to do with sort of climate change and um, it, Pauline, Councillor Monroe's already uh, drawn attention to a uh, problem in the woods uh, and illness. Uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, with the increased fire risk and things, um, the do, are are you aware of um, sort of uh, forestry schemes? Do they do they make sure that the fire breaks are the fire breaks are uh, kept clear so that you're not um, you know you're not encountering um, fires which uh, spread uh, from one section to the next uh, because they're not they're not uh, they're not broken by the the fire breaks. Is that a concern? to you at the oh, moment. Absolutely. We, we do try and work closely with uh, Forestry Commission and landowners and you know if, if they are burning that we try and encourage them to look at the weather and pull a few estates together or, or groups of people and and do it in as controlled a manner as possible. Uh, yeah. We have a, a new wildfire strategy because climate change is having a huge impact on us with yeah. the wildfires sort of through the heart of months and then flooding has become much more of a challenge as well. And it's just something we have to, to live with, but we are heating up to provide more equipment to PPE, and we have strategies in place where we set up working groups and ways with forestries and things like that, and encourage them to not only make themselves available to support us in the event of a fire, but to do things like making sure the fire breaks are are maintained at the right height, making sure they're they're cutting where they have to, that access and routes and roads are maintained. So yeah, we certainly work away with that to the best that we can. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, I know you'll be uh, busy. Um, if there's no no further questions from any of the members, um, thanks very much uh, for your time today, Ricky, and uh, and for your best wishes. So, um, all the best uh, to you in the service. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, we'll see you soon. Bye. 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 Okay, um, right. The next item on the agenda is the winter service plan for roads, um, which has been circulated in advance. Um, Ian Moncrief, I can see, has uh, appeared on my screen. Um, so, uh, First of all, we'll we'll start with any uh, comments on the winter service plan, um, and then uh, maybe if uh, if Ian has uh, has some time, we, we can uh, digress into other roads matters. But um, we'll start off with the winter service plan, and Ian, if you want to introduce it, um, on you go. Good morning, councillors. Um, we have a, a winter uh, treatment policy which is approved at HQ committee, and that is to ensure that all areas receive the same winter treatment across the Highland Council. It essentially, it establishes the level of service to be provided. But within each of the areas, there's an area winter plan, and this sets out how we will deliver winter um, in this particular area, and that requires a committee approval. Looking at the winter routes, the Easter Ross area has in the order of 128 kilometres of roads. And with the best of intentions, we can't treat everything all at the same time. So we establish a set of priorities. Within the Easter Ross area, the primary routes account for 87 kilometres. Um, uh, at 22% of the, of the strategic network. Secondary routes, 18%. These are the service and school bus routes. And the others uh, account for 60%. In terms of treatment, we usually have um, either 10 grams per square metre for frost, um, 20 grams per square metre for ice, 
and up to 40 grams per square meter for heavy snow. But because the gritters can only carry so much, this may be split into multiple runs. Treatment times, Mondays to Fridays, primaries, we aim to treat all the routes by 8.30, secondaries by nine o'clock, and others as resources permit. At the weekends, primaries we treat by 8.30, and secondary and others are as resources permit. Across Ross and Cromarty, uh, as you're well aware, there's, it, it's a vast area. Um, so it's too much to coordinate the whole of the winter in one group. So we've split it into east and west groups. Each group is both independent, but can assist the other group. And the East Ross area is part of the east group. So how does it work? Every day at noon, over the winter period, there's a, there's a duty officer and their role is to check the forecast and make a decision to either treat all or some of the routes and to determine the level of treatment. For example, if there's snow, it might be 20 grams with blades fitted. This information is passed to the foreman in the depots who organise the drivers and the gritters. Um, we also undertake evening treatment that night and in the morning um, of the following day as appropriate. And we receive a forecast update in the evening at six o'clock and also in the morning at six o'clock, which is also used to help confirm or amend the actions. In addition to this, uh, we also have ice alert sensors which are built into the roads. And these record information such as the temperature, the presence of salt on the sensor, and the moisture content, etc. In the morning, if the temperatures rise quicker than expected, the gritters can be recalled to the depot. Um, and uh, alternatively, we can um, we can amend that action based on both the forecast and the the real time data that we receive from the sensors. Both the, both the East and the West group have their own duty officer. And this works well for our area because it's just, uh, as, as I said earlier, geographically, it's too big for one duty officer to manage. The East of Ross area is serviced from Tain and Olness depots. And there's four gritters covering um, that, that area. So I hope this gives you a little summary of our winter operations and uh, I ask that members approve the winter service plan for the Easter Ross area, and I'd be pleased to take any questions. Okay, is anybody any questions? Uh, Molly? Thank you for that, Ian. I was just wondering, um, item 4.3, it's about the, the, the percentage of the gritter fleet that can start at 5 a.m. if there's adverse weather. Obviously, 10% isn't a lot of the gritter fleet, and I'm just wondering if there's any implications there for Easter Ross. Is there an allocation there if, if, if necessary? If we have adverse weather, um, we have to sort of deal with that as we sort of see fit. Um, we might have some, 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 some warning of it from the day before, perhaps the evening before, but quite often, um, the forecast, it's, it's only a forecast and the, um, the our, our, our provider, uh, MetDesk, they, they tend to present a worst case scenario that's likely to happen so that our actions are more, uh, we're more likely to be standing down than to be increasing our, our treatment. However, we do make use of that 5 a.m. Um, facility, but what we've got to bear in mind is that that can have a knock on effect due to driver's hours at the end of the day. So it's it's not just a case of starting everything earlier because we'd have to finish earlier as well. Uh, Alistair, have you got a question? I'm seeing you wave in there. 
Sorry, I, I can't find my hand on this computer. No bother. I don't know what's happened to Ian A, thank you for your report. Can I just ask firstly, is there any, uh, is the service we're going to get the same as we've enjoyed in the past year? Is there any cutbacks to the service? No, there's there's no cutbacks to the service, Councillor Ryan. Um, certainly nothing that I'm aware of. Um, there are pressures every year. There's, there's pressures. The price of salt is likely to go up. Um, fuel is certainly going up. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you can imagine that with the inflation, our costs will go up. However, um, we treat winter very seriously and we would be making sure that we can deliver the same level of service. Probably the biggest impact we have is driver's hours. Um, so we have to manage that as best we can. Thank you. You, you. you talked about, you know, when they'll have the blade down, etc. Quite often we'll see snow, quite heavy snow lying, but the, the blade's not down, you know, see the snow plough going up. Sometimes they salt, sometimes they don't salt, but uh, certainly the blade's not down. And sometimes I feel, well, that allows then the cars to come in and compact the snow. And so, so why would that be the case that the snow's falling but the blade's not down? Yeah, it's um, on the bottom of the blade. There's a there's a rubber strip, rubber strip. and and that's that's to try and protect first of all the blade and trying to to prevent damage to the to the ironwork to the road surface. But the blade's only really useful. If we get about 20 centimetres, sorry, 20 millimetres of road, 20 centimetres, 20 millimetres of snow, much below that, it's it's it tends to just to skip over the over the top of it, and that's probably uh, what you would see in, I would imagine. Very good. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, any other members uh, with any comments to make? OK, right. Um, we have uh, two recommendations. Members are asked to approve the winter service plan for 2022-23. Um, can we agree that? OK, that's affirmative. And 2.2, .2, members are asked to note that COVID-19 and driver's hours regulations will potentially have an impact on the winter service provided. Uh, so can we note uh, that information from the service? OK, uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much to you, Ian. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll catch up. Uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. Uh, thanks very much for your time today. Not at all. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, right. Thanks again. Uh, Thanks I, to see you. Uh, bye. Uh, can I uh, hop back to the previous uh, one? We only had one task to uh, one task to perform, um, and uh, in my first duty as uh, chair, I managed to skip past without doing it. So, uh, the recommendation um, on the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service report was. Committee members are invited to comment and scrutinise the attached area performance report. Uh, can we agree that we did comment and scrutinise on it? OK, thanks very much. All right, we'll move on. Uh, the next. Apologies, Derek, I have to go now, so sorry. Um, OK, thanks, you thanks later. Maxine. All right, bye bye. Bye. Um, number seven is Invergordon Common Good Fund. Um, now um, we've uh, we've got the report there. Um, uh, Phil, are are you speaking to this report? Yes, I'll speak to this one and the same one. That's fine. Thanks. Okay, members, you've got a copy of the report. Uh, you'll note the income and expenditure in the first quarter of the current financial year. There are two ongoing common good issues. The first is the town hall. So following your decision and then council decision to dispose of it, 
The council's property service is preparing the materials to market the town hall and it, it is expected to be put on the market shortly. The second one is the Bouchard and Bust. So again, following the area committee decision of February 2022, which just to remind you was to commence work on an options appraisal and outline business case for use of any seed corn money returned from the sale of the Bouchard and Bust. So following that decision, initial discussions have taken place with Sotheby's, but they are just initial di discussions. And a report will be brought to East Ross Area Committee once all the relevant relevant information has been gathered. So to the recommendations, members are asked to scrutinise and note the quarter one monitoring statement for the Invergordon Common Good Fund and note the update on current Invergordon Common Good issues. Thank you. Okay, would uh, any of the local members or any of the members like to comment on the report? Uh, Molly? Thank you uh, for that, Phil. I was just wondering about the appendix, um, the unusable, the, sorry, the unaudited usable reserves stand at £81,305. I apologise if there's common knowledge amongst returning members, but I just wondered if you could let us know uh, a brief explanation of what those reserves are, where they're held, and uh, if there's any recourse to the community being able to use them. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I don't know whether any of the standing members do, um, but I can find it. If that isn't the case, then I will find out and, and let members know. And uh, Councillor Monroe. Yeah, Molly, that's a good question. That was a question I was going to bring up with, with Phil as well. I've already sent an email to Helen to maybe find, get an update for you, because I know certainly my memory is crap. I can't lie. We do the best we can do at the time and hope to goodness we've done the best. I also want to thank you for your email about the bust because I thought it was very succinct and it made sure that we didn't we didn't have to answer them because you'd given them the answer and it was a very good thank you. Yeah, but apart from that, I have asked Helen to update you on everything that we were told the last time as well because, I mean, I just can't remember. Sorry, I'm not much help, but sorry. Okay, uh, Councillor Collier. Sorry, I was on mute. I forgot. Right. Uh, regarding the uh, the bust, there are lots of concerns in the local community. Now, uh, following on with the paper articles and so on. Now, do I, do we know where the bust is right now? And is it actually going for a sale? If so, is it going to come to the community it's like a public uh, consultation? before it goes or make the decision on it. Thanks. And uh, Councillor Munro, uh, you want back in? You're still on mute, sorry. God, I'm rubbish at this today. <laughs> No, my re what I was going to say was Phil maybe know much more about it than me, but my recollection of it was is that it was never ever we were never ever going to sell this bust. It was a case of we were trying to find out what its worth was really. Nobody was ever it was never discussed it was going up for sale. We just needed to find out what it was worth to Ember Gordon and would it be of any good to Ember Gordon at a later time. But we couldn't do any of that until we found out a, a costing. For the bus that's my recollection of it all but again hopefully helen will fill you in on that as well girls okay so the answer, answer the first part of your question council collier no i don't know where it is but uh, i assume that it's in safe uh, hands and regarding any sale uh, i think like councillor munro says no decision has been made this is about finding out information so that an options appraisal can be put together and that would then come back to members. But I know also in the press release, which was kind of based largely on the advice of the Common Good Officer, Sarah Murdoch, that um, it said no proposal on the future of the bust has been prepared. And should any proposal to sell come forward in the future, this will be subject to a full public consultation under the Community Empowerment Act. So hopefully that gives you some reassurance that not only will there be community involvement, but also there will be involvement of this committee. Uh, Councillor Collier. Can I quickly ask another question? Now, it's the bust values about 1.4 million. 
So is it not possible for us to have it in a local museum, like not in Invergordon, but in within the country and generate funds for Invergordon or community use? Just a thought, sorry. And Councillor Monroe. Again, yes, Tamal, you're quite right. That's the whole point of us trying to find out the price of it, really, with Beyond City, because we, we, everyone's just guessing at the moment. When we first heard about it, we had no idea it could be £2, it could be £2 million. We had no idea. Because to me, it looked like it was something you would buy out of buy, swap, sell. You know, I shouldn't say that, but it's true. So I had no, we had no idea of costs or what, you know, we had none of that idea. So the whole point for us was to try and get a, 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 as close to a cost as we could so that it would benefit the people of Invergordon. There's no point in us going to them and saying, we've got this bus, it's worth two million to find out it was worth a pound. Do you know what I mean? So that was our whole point of trying to find out first. There's no point in putting great expectations out there and us not having the money at the end of it so that was the point of at the time so hopefully once it gets moved forward and we have a costing that's something we can all discuss and and hopefully benefit the town of Invergordon. Oh okay uh Councillor Rind. Thank you Chair. Uh, you know like the team common good fund and any issues that pertain to that I'd always taken to the community council for their views and comments and uh, and other bits and pieces. Has that been the same with this in Invergordon? Uh, my understanding is that the community council feel that they haven't been the uh, they don't know much about what's going on here. Um, it may be that it's, there's been a change of community council, a change of the management of the new community council, I'm not very sure, but I just wanted to clarify that the community council is still regarded as a consultee on common good matters. Thank you. And Councillor Munro. Absolutely, you're right, Alistair. And actually, right at the very start, the community council had the same discussions with us as we have had as, as I have had with Molly and Tamala right now about this bust. So again, it was just a case of they knew it was there, otherwise they wouldn't know about it. You know, they knew it was there, uh, we knew it was there, we, we didn't have a costing. I don't think it's going as fast as they would have liked, but that's like a lot of things. But we can't make it go any faster than it's going to go. And certainly we will definitely be back in touch with Invergordon Community Council with more information. But I have to say, when Molly sent that email to him this morning, I have to say, I, I I couldn't have answered any better myself, so I, I thought it was a very good, succinct answer and it was an honest answer. So I'm hoping that that will calm the storm a little bit because it, this was never any bad intentions of not telling it the community council. was none of that. It was just a case of we didn't know, so we couldn't lie to them, so we couldn't tell them everything. You know, it, it's it's a it's a catch twenty two, Alistair. But certainly, yes, they all knew about it, and they, yeah, that's probably going to be a bit of a bun fight later. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... Also, do you want back in? Or? Uh, thank you to Pauline and uh, uh, Derek and I know about bum fights with community council. <laughs> um, Molly. Thank you. I just wanted to sort of follow on from what uh, Pauline was saying. And I, I think there's just been uh, in recent days a bit of inaccurate media reporting uh, or, or possibly just confuse, confusion amongst uh, the community. So, yeah, I hope that things will settle down now. But it was a very good um, statement from Duncan and the corporate communications team. So I'm very grateful for that. OK, we'll pass on. Uh, pass on your regards to the, uh, the corporate comms team. I, th I think... I think Duncan's actually online, um, so I'm I'm sure he'll have he'll have picked that up. Right. Um, so uh, the report asks members uh, to scrutinise and note uh, the quarter one monitoring statement for the Invergarden Common Good Fund, and to note the update on current Invergarden Common Good issues. Uh, can you agree those? Uh, recommendations. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Phil, for uh, the the work on Invergordon Common Good. Um, I think we're uh, we're moving on now to Tain Common Good. Okay, thank you. So uh, again, members have a copy of the report in front of them. Uh, you you will know the income and expenditure for the first quarter of the current financial year, including property costs. 
plus the potential cost of removing the abandoned vehicle like, likely to be incurred in the, in, the, in the subsequent quarter. Rental income from market stores and grazings, which is expected to be on budget. The progress with resurfacing of the Golf Club Road and the proposed expenditure of £1,000 to match fund um, a, a grant application to pay for survey equipment for tame mussel beds. The current common good issue raised in the report is, relates to Blair Leath, and members will know the transfer of £4,837.93 to the Tain Common Good Fund, being 50% of the proceeds of the sale of Unit 2B, which took place in 2018 but was never transferred to the fund. And the recommendation is that members are asked to scrutinise and note the quarter one monitoring statement for the Tain Common Good Fund. Thank you. Okay. Um... The Alistair, do you have any questions on Team Common Good? I didn't quite pick up your last point about money that was should have been transferred in 2018. Could you just repeat that one, Phil, if you don't mind? Sorry, did you hear that, Phil? I did. Sorry, Alistair, I was just yep. uh, finding the right place in my notes. So, um, as I understand it, there was some question over the ownership of Blaleath, mm -hmm. and there was a, the looks into the transactions, and there was a sale of Unit 2B in 2018, and the agreement had been that that would be split between the Common Good Fund and the Council, and but, but it just didn't take place. So following the kind of investigation into that, the proceeds of £9,675.86 have been divided 50-50, so the common good is now getting £4,837.93, which is kind of half of the sales, of, so half the proceeds of that sale. Right, I'm grateful for you clarifying that, and it just the raises issues that Derek mainly has raised over the past number of years, and Sarah Mardis investigating that, so hopefully a satisfactory conclusion will come to these issues in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I think we um, we note the position. We're grateful for the work that uh, Sarah Mur Murdoch's done up to this point, um, which has resulted in £4,837.93 being passed over to the, uh, the Tain Common Good Fund. Um, clearly, um, there are issues there in regard to the ownership of the remainder of the land. Um, we note uh, with interest that 100% of the income um, is going to the service uh, and none of the income uh, for rentals on the estate is, is coming to the Common Good Fund. Um, so we'll, we'll follow that up um, with with Sarah and try to try to find out um, how how this has come about, um, but we're grateful for the work that she's done um, up to this point, and for a share of the proceeds of the sale of uh, that unit uh, coming to the Common Good Fund. I think it's it's the first time that we can identify any uh, any proceeds of any sale of Blair Lath uh, coming back to the common good fund from which it originated so um so we're grateful for that work um do any of the other members uh want to comment on team common good fund okay um uh, well if i can <laughs> i can't move mouse isn't moving <laughs> oh dear um, yeah, I can't move my mouse, but just would you like me to read them for you? Is it the recommendations uh, you're you looking could, for? Yeah, if if you could, uh, Fiona, that would be very helpful. No problem. It's the committee is invited to note the quarter one monitoring statement for the Tain Common Good Fund. Okay, can we agree that? We've scrutinised and noted the quarter one monitoring statement for the Tain Common Good Fund. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so if we can move on. Next on the agenda. Um, right, so I, I think the last thing there is um, minutes uh, circulated for noting minutes of the meeting of Easter Ross Area Committee held on 17th of February 2022. Um, does anybody have any comments on the, the minutes that were circulated? Uh, Councillor Collier. Can I quickly check with you? Uh, under the com committee agreed uh, positions on the uh, minute, they we have a like you know you have agreed uh, for investing thirty thousand uh, and sorry forty thousand. Am I getting it right? Sorry, thirty five thousand for Inver Gordon for CCTV and then another two thousand eight hundred and eighty seven pound and sixty four pence for Shaw Road project in Inver Gordon. Can I know what's happening with them? Are these just agreed at the last meeting then? I think, uh, yeah, those things were agreed at the previous meeting in February. Um, Councillor Monroe, I think, is going to help us out. But she's on mute. And she's still on mute. On mute, my gosh. I've only been doing this a week, as you can tell, eh? <laughs> Sorry. Basically, what I was trying to say to you was the reason we decided for that uh, money for the Shore Road was because at the time in Invergordon, we were having lots and lots and lots of very, I'm trying to put this politely, <laughs> hard meetings um, surrounding the Port Authority and how the buses were going down the street and there was lots and lots of commotion at the time. So we put the money to, to that area because that was one of the biggest areas of concern at the time because we needed more places for the buses to go because there were so many buses coming up and down our high street and not using the bypass where we were asking them to use but they weren't using it but it's like everything else people don't so that was the reason for that money the other money the cctv money we did that in Allness and in and in Invergordon. I think the the prices are slightly different because of the area, the the size of the area. But it's basically the same sort of system that we were asking for to go in. And it was basically because again we had a lot of complaints about older people's windows getting on the high streets, windows getting broken, eh, their doors being kicked. So it was basically just to give them a bit of reassurance that somebody's watching. And that was the reasoning. I'm just trying to give you the reason why we we chose to use the money that way. And hopefully that'll help you. But I mean, we can we can discuss it any time you want to. Just give me a wee shout, guys. Okay. Thank uh, you. Are there any other comments um, on the minutes? Okay. Um, right. Well, I'll we'll get back to the back to the the top of my agenda. So they're circulated for noting. Um, so can we agree that we've noted them? OK, right. Well, uh, just before um, I close the meeting, a, I, it would, a, I think, be appropriate for me to, a, to pay tribute to my predecessor as chair of the Easter Ross Area Committee, uh, Councillor Fiona Robertson, um, who who did a, a sterling job um, all, all of her days on the council. Uh, she was a hard working and effective councillor um, for Tain and Easter Ross and for the wider Easter, Easter Ross area, um, including the Cromarty Firth Ward. Um, so I think, you know, I think we'd all like to thank her for her efforts over the years and wish her every success uh, for the future. OK, now I'll check with uh, Phil and Fiona that I didn't forget to do anything before I before I draw the meeting to a close. Um, I think it all looks fine to me. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Phil, are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. 
yeah, I'm happy as well. Thanks. Okay. Um, Duncan, are there any corporate comms uh, coming out of this meeting that you want to discuss? And I see Pauline. Uh, Pauline, you've got your hand up. I'll wait for Duncan. It's okay. I'll see what Duncan's fine. I'll just wait. Okay. Okay. Uh, Duncan? Maybe he doesn't have any hand. Uh, no, all good, Derek. Um, I've just sent you uh, a couple of drafts there, so uh, thanks for That's that. That's fine. I'll I'll take a look at them. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Polly? This is just a quick note before we go, Derek. I hope you don't mind me putting in here because, well, we're all busy and we never get a chance to see each other these days. But it's just to say that Molly and Tamala, if you've got any questions about anything that's on, on that, Last week, you just haven't, you just don't know any of this. You're all just new to this. I mean, it's it's quite daunting. I remember my first time reading it all. Gosh, I had no idea. <laughs> it's, it's only taking me now to realise what we actually spend it on. You know that? That's terrible. No, honestly, please just give me a shout. Just send me a, pop me an email, and I will explain it the best way I possibly can, girls. Thanks, and thanks, Derek. Yeah. Great meeting. Okay, and uh, Molly, um, there's usually a like an area uh, committee pre-meeting. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the protocol normally is, but I'd be very happy um, for the for the vice chair to come along. Um, I, I'm uh, diabetic uh, and that can always lead uh, to complications. There's always a chance I'll, uh, I'll fall under the proverbial bus. So, you know, it makes sense for uh, for both of us to know what's going on. Um, so if you're OK with that, um, I'll invite you along. OK. Right. Um, well, I think uh, I think I've uh, performed all my tasks uh, to my limited ability. So, uh, on on that uh, on that basis, I'll draw the meeting to a close. Okay. Thanks very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.